1809, the year of the snake. The greatest naval powers, among which the British, the Portuguese and the Dutch, stand alongside the Chinese to try and put a stop to the most powerful pirate of their time. Commanding some 70,000 men and over 1,000 ships, this pirate was known as the Terror of Asia. And unlike other infamous pirate captains, this one managed to walk away from it. Not only to live to tell the tale, but with all capital intact as well. But the most impressive part of it all? This was no man. It was a woman, one who worked her way up from prostitution to become the most feared captain of the South China Sea. Her name? Zhang Shi. Little is known about the early years of Zhang Shi. Zhang Shi is not even a real name, but is suspected to be Shi Yang. A more popular name, Zhang Shi, in fact means the widow of Zhang. Her name first appeared in the history books in 1801, when henchmen of the feared pirate leader Zhang Ye plundered the floating brothels in the port of Canton. Zhang Ye was one of the most feared Chinese pirate captains at the time, commanding the powerful Red Flag fleet. According to the stories, Zhang Ye was deeply in love with a handsome prostitute who worked in one of Canton's floating brothels. He ordered his men to kidnap her from the brothel and to bring her to him, as he wanted to make the beautiful prostitute his bride. Much to their surprise, she did not simply agree, however. She demanded half of all his revenues and the command of one of his ships before she was willing to say yes. You would not regret it, because Sheng Ye turned out to be a shrewd businesswoman and an organizational genius. On her recommendation, Zhang Ye moved his activities from the coast of Vietnam to the Chinese coastal province of Guangdong. His fleet grew exponentially, and in 1804, he even blocked the trading port of Macau for two months. English ships eventually had to come to the aid of the Portuguese in order to break the blockade. In 1805, Zheng Ye and Zheng Shi brokered an alliance between five other pirate fleets that at the time terrorized the coast of China. Each fleet bore its own color, yellow, blue, green, black, and white. And each fleet was assigned an area where they were more or less given sole rights to plunder. The largest fleet, however, was the Red Fleet of Zhang Ye, making him the most powerful pirate in South China. In total, they commanded 1,200 ships, and anywhere from 50,000 to 70,000 crew members, enough to rule the entire Chinese Sea, from Korea in the north to the beaches of Malaysia in the south. Fate struck for Zheng Ye in 1807, however, when his ship was struck by a typhoon. He was washed overboard and died drowning off the coast of Vietnam. For a moment, the alliance of the Red Flag fleet seemed at the brink of falling apart, but Zhang Shi was determined not to let that happen. She entered into alliances with the most important crew members of her in-laws, persuaded the other pirate leaders not to abandon her, and entered into a new relationship with Zhang Pao, who was 21 at the time, about 10 years younger than Zhang Shi. It was a special relationship, because Zhang Pao was incidentally her adopted son. At the age of 15, this fishing son was abducted by the pirates in 1801, and Zhang Yi and Zhang Shi had more or less adopted him and called him their son. He quickly made a name for himself as a pirate, and in 1807, he was the second highest in the Red Fleet. With her position strengthened through the influence of Zhang Pao, Zhang Shi managed to prevent the collapse of the coalition, but her position was anything but safe. Most ordinary pirates were not at all eager to follow the orders of a prostitute. Zhang realized that there was only one way that she could prove to the pirates that she wasn't a weak woman. With an iron fist. She came up with a new code of conduct that was so strict that even her biggest opponent would think twice before questioning her leadership. Ironically, stealing from the pot was the worst thing a pirate could do. The ships had to keep records of how much loot they captured. All loot had to be registered, and 80% of it went into the shared treasury. Keeping more than 20% per ship, mutual theft on board the ships, stealing from the common treasury, and plundering allied villages was all subject to the death penalty. And those who disembarked without permission or disobeyed the orders of the captains had their ears cut off. After all, if you do not listen, then you do not need ears. 
In addition to these common laws, Zheng also introduced a number of special rules that serve to protect women. From now on, the favorite pastime of pirates, raping women, faced the death penalty. Even consensual sex between a pirate and a captured woman was not allowed. In such a case, not only did the pirate pay for it with his life, but the woman was also thrown overboard with cannonballs tied to her feet. The only relationship that Zhang allowed her pirates was the one that she had enjoyed with Zhang, a marriage by mutual consent. If a pirate really wanted a captured woman, he could make a bid for her, provided the captain gave permission for this. Some imprisoned women were meant for the ransom trade and were not allowed to be hurt. If a pirate was the highest bidder, however, he could make a claim on her instead, but only on the condition that he would marry her too. All in all, thanks to her precise but relentless rule, Zhang Shi transformed the bloody and chaotic work of the pirates into a structured business. And business was good. Under its strict leadership, the red flag subsequently spread all across the waters of Asia. Within a few years, Zhang commanded 200 warships, 800 smaller vessels, and more than 17,000 men. This immense pirate army enjoyed undisputed rule over the sea, was able to plunder to its heart content, managed to subdue entire areas, and even set its own government and tax there. Shangxi had become mistress of the Asian seas, her fleet having grown large enough to rival even the naval forces of Imperial China itself. In a desperate attempt to regain control of the China Sea, the Chinese Emperor enlisted the help of the British, Portuguese and Dutch in order to patrol the various shipping lanes of the Chinese Sea. They too failed to discourage the Pirate Queen, however. In fact, Qing only became more powerful with each foe she defeated due to the special treatment of her prisoners. They were given two options, either they joined the Pirates or be clubbed to death. For most, this wasn't exactly a difficult choice, and so Zheng's army continued to expand. British East India Company officer Richard Glasspole, who was kidnapped in 1809 and spent 11 weeks in captivity with Zhang Shi and her pirates, described in the book how he and five other kidnapped British sailors had to join in on one of their many raids and were supposed to fight along. For each severed head, their ransom would be reduced by $20. In a desperate attempt to put an end to the terror of the Red Flag fleet, the Chinese government made a remarkable offer in 1810. It promised grace to all pirates who would immediately lay down their weapons. Zhang Pao rejected this offer, however, seeing little to be gained from such an offer. With no other option left but to fight the pirates head-on in a decisive battle, Imperial China joined forces with the Portuguese navy. Joined by some of the Portuguese's most advanced ships, equipped with reinforced hulls and explosive shells, the Portuguese set out to confront the Red Flag fleet head-on under the leadership of Captain José Pinto Alcoforado e Sousa. Zhang Xi and Zhang Pao had taken control of the Humen Strait, known to the Portuguese as the Boca do Tigre, the Tiger's Mouth, when a Portuguese flotilla of six ships moved in to engage their entire fleet. The stage had been set, as the tiger's mouth was set to close upon the greatly outnumbered Portuguese fleet. The entire strait was painted red with the flags of the Red Fleet as they searched upon the technologically superior Portuguese ships. A thick fog arose as smoking cannons and gun barrels alike exchanged a flurry of gunfire, and the pirate junk ships surrounded the greatly outnumbered Portuguese. It was in those overwhelming numbers where the problem lied, however. Despite their numbers, the pirate fleet had in fact great difficulties maneuvering around the small Portuguese fleet without blocking each other's path or line of fire. The Portuguese gunners, on the other hand, could accurately fire explosive rounds on a concentrated mass of enemy junks. Before too long, the pirate fleet scattered, retreating in the shallow Hyansan River, where Portuguese ships couldn't enter due to their larger thought. Captain Alcoforado ordered the river mouth to be blockaded, and, at long last, the great pirate fleet was cornered and trapped. The Battle of the Tiger's Mouth had ended, and this time, it had not ended in Jing Shi's favor. The time had come to count their losses and to negotiate with the Chinese Emperor. On February 21st, Zhang Shi signed a peace treaty whereby she agreed to submit to the Chinese Emperor. In exchange, 
Zhang Pao was rehabilitated and candid the position of admiral under the service of the emperor to fight other pirates. Additionally, the great majority of their crew was granted amnesty and were allowed to keep their loot or continue to serve under Zhang Pao in the emperor's service. As for Zhang Shi, she received a noble title with accompanying rights from the emperor and retired to civil life. And all the booty she had accumulated over the years, that was her retirement package. Thanks to her cleverness and her courage, Zhang Shi spent her last years not as a criminal in prison, but by collecting her wealth and retiring as an ordinary citizen. That is, as ordinary as one gets running a casino in Canton. There, she became a mother, and eventually, a grandmother. She finally died 34 years later, in 1844, at the beautiful age of 69. And so, of all pirates in history, Zhang Shi was not only one of the most successful pirates, but also one of the few pirate captains who enjoyed the richness and freedom of a peaceful old age. This video was made for Project Her Story. Project Her Story is a collaboration effort of various wonderful and talented content creators on history subject in honor of Women's Month. This project will feature an entire playlist worth of videos about all the amazing female leaders we have seen throughout history. I've included a link to the playlist in the description down below, so do be sure to check it out if you haven't already. There are plenty of YouTubers in there who are far more talented and charismatic than me, so be sure to give them a watch. For now, however, I would like to thank you very much for watching this video and wish you a lovely day.